Philadelphia, who was going to share with us uh, her results with gene therapy in four patients with hemophilia B. Catherine, please. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, the European Hematology Association for giving us an opportunity to provide an overview of these data, and I'm uh, presenting this work on behalf of Spark Therapeutics, where I actually work now, uh, and our colleagues at Pfizer, uh, who are partners in this work, uh, investigators at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and at the University of Mississippi Medical Center and Dr. Spencer Sullivan of the University of Mississippi Medical Center will be presenting the data uh, this afternoon. So I've been working in this field for about 20 years and it gives me great pleasure to say that I'm finally happy with where the results are. Um, so hemophilia is an X-linked bleeding disorder caused by a deficiency of either factor 9, which is called hemophilia B, or factor 8, hemophilia A. And the work today is about hemophilia B. Um, the disease is characterized by recurrent bleeds into the joints. And on the bottom picture there, if you've never seen a joint bleed, this is a little boy uh, with an untreated bleed. And you can see that the joint expands until it fills with blood and the back pressure from uh, the bleed finally pinches off the uh, vessels and the bleeding stops. The most famous sufferer of hemophilia B is shown in the picture above, Alexei Nikolaevich, the last heir to the Romanov throne, who ironically did not die of hemophilia, but of the events of the Russian Revolution. The largest category of patients are severely affected and have less than 1% normal levels of factor IX, uh, but patients with a a uh, modest increase into the range of 1 to 5 percent are moderately severe, and those with levels above 5 percent of normal are only mildly affected. And currently we manage hemophilia by intravenous infusion of clotting factor concentrates anywhere from three times a week to once every 10 days or so for extended half-life products, but patients are maintained on these intravenous infusions for life. Previous work in gene therapy has uh, been shown to achieve levels in the range of 5 to 7 percent. These were data published by Amit Nathwani at uh, the University College London. But to achieve those levels required a dose that also elicited an immune response to the vector and required a brief course of steroids uh, for four out of six patients who received that dose. Now the work that's going to be presented today involves a novel uh, vector that we uh, developed at Spark. First of all, it has a novel bioengineered capsid, and this is the first test of this capsid in human subjects. And it drives, uh, under the control of a liver-specific promoter, a factor IX variant that encodes a high-specific activity factor IX species. And so, the trial itself involves intravenous infusion over a period of about one hour of this vector uh, in a saline solution. So the phase one, two study <coughs> that's being presented is, uh, is in adult males with severe hemophilia B, severe or moderately severe hemophilia B. And the primary goal of the study is to evaluate the safety and tolerability of this novel factor IX vector the hypothesis of the work was that if we could engineer a vector efficient enough, we would be able to infuse it at a dose low enough that it would drive levels of expression greater than 12% of normal, which in previous work has been shown to be associated with an absence of joint bleeds in natural history studies of people with mild disease and that infusion at a low dose would eliminate the need for any type of immune suppression with steroids. So the subjects that are uh, being presented today range in age from 18 to 47, and uh, the dose that was infused was five times 10 to the 11 vector genomes per kilogram of body weight. Uh, and we followed factor IX activity levels, liver enzymes, bleeding episodes, and factor usage, over a period ranging from seven weeks to 26 <coughs> weeks or six months after the vector infusion. And the results are shown here. So uh, as you can see in the graph on the right, I think one of the most remarkable features of the data in my mind has been a very consistent performance uh, among the four subjects infused thus far. There's a gradual rise in circulating levels of factor IX into the range of 20 
37 to 39 percent among these four individuals. It takes about 8 to 12 weeks to come up to the plateau. None of these individuals have, uh, have shown any evidence of an immune response that would, would require treatment with steroids. All of the subjects are completely off prophylactic infusion of uh, factor nine. And during the course of the follow-up, uh, there has been only one subject who infused himself once, and that was an individual uh, who treated himself two days after vector infusion for a suspected ankle bleed. Now, all of these people get brought up to 100% at the point when they're infused, so the likelihood is that two days after that, he still had a good level on board, but anyway, you know, his instinct when he has ankle pain is to treat himself, and he did so. But other than that, none of these subjects have infused clotting <coughs> factor since they uh, were administered vector. So I'll just conclude by saying that the data to date suggests that a single intravenous infusion of this AAV vector encoding a high specific activity variant of factor nine at a low dose, five times 10 to the 11th vector genomes per kilogram, is driving factor nine activity levels in the range of 25 to 39 percent. This is the lowest dose that I know of uh, that uh, has been used and is achieving factor nine activity levels well in excess of the 12 percent of normal that we know to be effective in preventing joint bleeds. Uh, and that these levels of factor nine activity are likely to be effective in keeping people free from bleeding. Uh, all of these participants have discontinued factor replacement without experiencing spontaneous bleeding episodes. None of them have required immune suppression, and observation is ongoing, and we're expanding the trial. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I think you and your team are to be congratulated for these best data I've ever seen. Oh, well, thank you Don't very you much. Don't you expect that thousands of patients would buy an ad ticket to Philadelphia to be treated <laughs> in the coming week? How are you going to handle this? Well, it's very, it's very important for me to say that the trial is open not only in Philadelphia, but in Jackson, Mississippi, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and as of next week at a site in California as well. So they don't have to buy a ticket to Philadelphia. How about the poor Europe? <laughs> um, we are not open anywhere outside of the United States right now. Uh, but we're looking forward to interacting with the regulators here. Exciting. Any questions, please? Yes. Just a, a question. Do you have any idea about the durability of the effect? We've seen that, you know, obviously uh, decline over time with other genetic therapies. Gene yeah, therapies. So, so that's a very important question. And uh, so what we do know is that having treated many, there's a naturally occurring dog model of hemophilia. And having, over the years, treated over 100 dogs with uh, AAV vectors, w what I can tell you is that the expression is quite durable in dogs. Probably our best evidence of durability in humans is that trial from University College London. And what you see in the data is that the real period of risk is in about the first eight to 10 weeks. And typically, if people make it past that without having an immune response, we know from those patients treated at University College London that uh, the, the first ones were treated in 2010. So we know that the expression has been quite durable since then. So if you make it past the first eight to 10 weeks when you're at risk for an immune response, then after that, it appears to be durable in humans as well. Would, would that suggest that then if people don't have that response, you could try to retreat? Well, the issue with retreatment is that people who are infused with an AAV vector will develop antibodies to AAV. And if you're going through the circulation, as all of this is, this is done by intravenous infusion, the antibodies will prevent the vector getting to the liver. So, you know, we're hematologists here, so hematologists know lots of tricks for getting around antibodies. And so this is an area of active investigation in the field right now. I mean, whether you would, for example, uh, give rituximab or some other anti-B cell compound. You, you have to transiently reduce the antibody titers to retreat. Thanks. Yes, uh, I just had a question. This is very exciting data. I couldn't help but ask a question. Um, <laughs> the uh, I saw that the I saw that the it looks like the factor levels were continuing to go up over time. Do you anticipate these to continue to go yeah, up? Yeah. So and my second question is, in the in the future. 
do you, where, where do you foresee this administration of drug in childhood? Uh, at what point do, will patients be receiving this? Okay, so those are both, both uh, very good questions. So the first question about the uh, kinetics of the rise. The graph that I showed there has uh, data for about 10 weeks, and you are correct. The plateau is typically reached between 8 and 12 weeks. I did this because I was only showing one small picture, but uh, if you see the presentation this afternoon, you'll see that you do reach a plateau somewhere between 8 and 12 weeks. So we know what the plateau levels are, and we know how long it takes to get there. Um, the second question about when is the ideal time to treat. So in gene therapy in general, if, uh, if there is a treatment already in place, we begin with adults. And I think that for hemophilia, we will want to have, you know, some reasonable level of confidence in the long-term safety before children are enrolled in studies. And so I would see this as initially being something that would be used in adults. And, you know, there, I think there will be pressure if the data uh, continue to look safe to move into younger individuals because, you know, the, the treatment itself which works great. I mean, protein treatment works great, but it's, it's a burden to patients and their families. If any, what, what sort of long-term side effects, unwanted side effects, would you expect based on all your experience so far? Yeah, yeah. So, again, fortunately, we do have patients who have been followed for a long time after uh, AAV infusion. And uh, the theoretical risk is that even though AAV is a non-integrating vector, we know that with the doses that are given here, there will be some low level of vector integration. And then the risk of that, as we know from the X-Link SCID trials, is some sort of insertional mutagenesis event. So uh, in long-term follow-up of all patients uh, who have received AV in the liver, we do periodic liver ultrasounds looking for any evidence of anything. So far, we haven't seen anything. Same for these uh, dogs. So I think that the, the risk of that is low. It's theoretical at this point. It's never been observed in a person. But that, to me, would be the long-term risk. Keep a close look to your patients. Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you.